Welcome to Shrimp Cover, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for, for part four of a four-part series, or just the review of Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast. Yeah. Gorgeous book. Wonderful book. We're going to talk about it a little bit today. Yeah. I'm excited. We've got three good things, three bad things, quotes, literary analysis, rating, and recommendation on the text that is A Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway. Dalton, what have you got? Oh, we start with our good things here. Three good things. Three good things. First and foremost, this is a truly unique experience. You are not going to get it anywhere else. Uh, this is a unique book, a unique period in time, and it exists in its own. Number two, you've never seen this Hemingway before, and it only makes you like him all the more. Uh, it's something you've brought up quite a few times throughout uh, these last few weeks. This is a new Hemingway, and it just makes the idea of Hemingway all the better. And finally, number three, some of the insights and in quotes that are dropped in here are drop dead gorgeous. Just wonderful. Can't get any better. Adrian? My three good things. Number one, this is hilarious. This is hilarious. This is some of the best written comedy I have ever read. Number two, uh, what a way to get a look at some of the greats. True. From one of the greats, right? Uh, this is, you say this is a unique experience. This is a unique point of view. Okay. It is it's difficult. It, we don't ever really get the great on the great, right? Um, and number three, goes a little bit with what you said, I now feel my Hemingway experience is more complete. I, uh, I didn't know Hemingway was this funny. Okay. Um, I didn't know that Hemingway was this unforgiving to himself. I didn't know that Hemingway was this uh, hipsterish, which we'll get into a little bit <laughs> in my three bad things. But it truly makes it all the better. But now I've got this, and I am able to incorporate this into my understanding of Hemingway. Good, very good. I was apprehensive when we started this book because, like, I love it. I, I was apprehensive because of that first go. I thought you'd like it, but the first week you're like, uh, but then it started snowballing from there all as well. But with the good, there are bad. Three, three bad, bad things. things. Let's never do that again. Uh, number one, if you don't read carefully, some of the humor here is going to be lost. You have to make sure you know what you're reading. It's situational comedy from a written perspective. So you have to be in it. You have to be on point with your reading on this. Number two, knowing the cast of characters, I feel, is needed to get a better understanding of what's going on here. If you don't know who Hemingway is, you don't know who Fitzgerald is, who Ezra Pound is, a lot of this is just going to seem throwaway. But once you identify who they are, it makes it all the better. Yep. Number three, it's really just a book about a guy wandering around Paris. I mean, I, there's no better way to cut it. it. It's been hard to speak about for the last three weeks, and it's going to be difficult to speak about a literary analysis, but it's just a guy wandering around yep. talking about things. Yeah. Um, my three bad things, number one, it's a slow start. Okay. That first little trick was painful for me. Um and just slow and aimless and wandering. Anyway, uh, number two, this is a proto-hipster text. This is the proto-hipster text. Um, we are talking about a semi-bohemian lifestyle and how great it is and how cool it was and how our friends were there and how we like drinking and we never go anywhere. My I interject on that one? Go ahead. My call to arms here, brethren. Are you talking to other hipsters? I'm speaking to other hipsters okay. at this point, so if you, if you tone out. Motherfuckers, you need to read this book. Uh, if you want that bohemian lifestyle, if you want that glorious, glorious bohemian spirit, movable feast. That's where it's at. Why aren't we reading this more? You're good. You're good. Number three, never actually goes anywhere. It, it, nothing materializes here. Oh, it's just wandering. It, it's just wandering and is wandering in different places. And we never build to anything. We never come back from anywhere. But that's what makes it so gorgeous. Is it's so simple, but so great. Yeah, but you, you can be simple and great and go somewhere too. There can be a point. There can be a point. Okay. Got some quotes? There can be a point. Okay. That's, that's a quote. How's that for a quote? I there can quotes. be a point. I've got plenty of quotes in this. This is a treasure tro trove. A treasure, treasure trove. Of God, we're just terrible we're, about that today. We are gathered here today. <laughs> From 58, 
Uh, but Paris was a very old city, and we were young, and nothing was simple there. Not even poverty, nor sudden money, nor the moonlight, nor right and wrong, nor the breathing of someone who lay beside you in the moonlight. I think that's one of my quotes. Oh, I hope it is. Damn it. Do you have another one? Yeah, okay. Do you have one other quote in here? <laughs> or you go, normally you go through yours and then I go through mine. Go well, through let me, okay, 54. Again, 147, one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard. I love it. You hate it. His talent was as natural as the pattern that was made by the dust on a butterfly's wings. At one time, he understood it no more than the butterfly did, and he did not know when it was brushed or marred. Later, he became conscious of its damaged wings and of their construction, and he learned to think and could not fly anymore because the love of flight was gone, and he could only remember when it had been effortless. It's fucking gorgeous. Yeah, that's, that's, it's pretty quoted. Cool. It doesn't mean anything. Why did you start reading it like a 1920s... Uh... Radio announcer. Because I felt his like talent be, was as his natural. His talent was as natural. From 95, look, if you can't write, why don't you learn to write criticism? <laughs> <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank I'm good. I, I'll give it to three. I have bookmarks all over this book. This from 12. Don't worry. Do not worry. You have always written before, and you will write now. All you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence that you know. From one. 15, that's not the question at all, but it is inaccroachable. That, mean, that means it is like a picture that a painter paints, and then he cannot hang it when he has a show, and no one will buy it, because they cannot hang it either. From 49, you stole my quote on 58. You're welcome. <clears throat> when spring came, even the false spring, there were no problems except where to be happiest. The only thing that could spoil a day was people. And if you could keep from making engagements, each day had no limits. People were always the limiters of happiness, except for, that, except for the very few that were as good as spring itself. And finally, 166. Get there. Back in the room, Scott was laying as though his... As though his tomb, sculpted as a monument to himself, his eyes closed and breathing with exemplary dignity. Hearing me come in the room, he spoke. Did you get the thermometer? I went over and put my hand on his forehead. It was not as cold as the tomb, but it was cool and not clammy. Nope, I said. I thought you'd bring it. I sent out for it. It's not the same thing. No, it isn't, is it? You could not be angry with Scott any more than you could be angry with someone who was crazy. But I was getting angry with myself for having become involved in the whole silliness. He did have a point, though, and I knew it very well. Most drunkards in those days died of pneumonia, a disease which had now been almost eliminated. But it was hard to accept him as a drunkard, since he was affected by such a small quantity of alcohol. From arguably one of the best scenes in this entire book. There are two great scenes in this book, and they're both Hemingway and Fitzgerald. The thermometer scene and the penis measuring. Yeah. Both of them are comedy gold. Yeah. If you put them on any TV show, just the idea of that, it's it's instantly sold. This is, honestly, this is the odd couple. Yeah. It, Perfectly. It, yeah. Word for word. Stroke for stroke. So where do you want to start with this here? Because I feel like a lot of this is just... I'm uh, going to be talking about the book as a whole. You can't really do a lot of literary analysis. The prose is great. It's Hemingway. But this is not a work of fiction. Well, that would be fine if it were not a work of fiction, if it still went somewhere. We could analyze it based on that. Okay. But it doesn't. So we don't have that, we don't have that in our repertoire, right? Okay. This is just meandering. Okay. I don't know if I mentioned it on the show in the past few weeks, but there uh, is a book that I read uh, very recently uh, from David Sedaris. It was his diaries. Uh, and the man faithfully kept a diary for decades and then decided to publish it. That's what you're getting from this. You're getting little snippets of life, little snippets of real life from someone famous. Uh, and it's from when they weren't really making it. They were just struggling to keep the, the heat on, basically, uh, selling stories here and there. All the way up to when we can argue Hemingway really took off. Uh, when The Sun Also Rises was just getting ready to come out. Uh, and at that point in time, it was just all uphill. Everything was great. Well, 
there is perhaps one end to the discussion that we can have. Is that what this is? Because this was published in 1964. Okay. A Farewell to Arms certainly was not. Okay. So this is Hemingway, the successful writer, remembering back. So this is necessarily fictionalized. There's okay. no way he remembers those conversations with, true, with very Fitzgerald, true. right? Perfect. There's no way this happens uh, pace for pace as it is being recounted. How truthful, how, how truthful is Hemingway being versus how honest is Hemingway being? There is no doubt in my mind that the dynamic between Hemingway and Fitzgerald is in Hemingway's mind as we get it on the page. I do not think he fictionalized their dynamic. Okay. He almost undoubtedly fictionized the goings on. Okay. Right? So what this is, what this is, do you remember, do you remember when Thor came out? The very first Thor. Didn't you come to Cameron to watch no, that No, you son of a bitch. You came out and you picked me up in that white tempo, was it? What was it? That was a white Dodge Neon, White sir. Dodge Neon. Every every bit girlier than a tempo. You're welcome. Right? So you came to my apartment and you picked me up and you had your missus at the time in that passenger seat who smelled like whiskey and cigarettes because that's, kind of, that's the kind of missus she was. And by God, I was sitting in the back seat and you two were listening to that hipster music and I can't remember anything Except for at one point, you pulled over and threw up because you had a rumbly tummy. Yeah? No, that never happened. Okay. But that's what this is. Okay, because I didn't is, remember see, any of it. See, none of that story... None of it happened. None, well, it happened except for the rumbly tummy part. But it doesn't matter because that's the truth to me. Okay. Right? And this is remembered. This is just Hemingway bullshitting on a page. This isn't Hemingway's fiction. This isn't Hemingway um, writing about... Uh, Francis McComber. This is Hemingway writing about himself and tell. Hey, remember that time we uh, we went and saw Thor? Okay. Right. That's what this is, which is very very different than any of his fiction, right? Okay. His fiction, you 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 got to know where you're going to get there. This isn't like that. Yeah, Hemingway doesn't know where he's going. No. This. Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, like I said, it is a very unique book. Uh, do I think it's worth reading? Absolutely so. Uh, first and foremost, again, it's unique. You're not going to get that anywhere else. But it also captures a time where, uh, for people who study literature, this is a time of greats. Uh, this is where everybody culminated at one period of time and just made magic. And it's about them. And it's all about them. So I don't think it is worth reading unless you're privy to that. Okay, I, I right. would give you that. If you are unfamiliar with uh, The Lost Generation, yeah. unfamiliar with all of them, yeah, it is necessary to things. know them. Uh, but if you're familiar, oh yeah, you have to read this. And it, I, I would argue, I don't think we've had a period of time like this since. Um, well, um, maybe not with literary fiction writer. The Iowa Writers Group is certainly going to be, the moment anyone decides to pin that book is going to be a, a, a big deal. Um, outside of fiction, I mean, you could talk about Look, Biggie Smalls and Tupac and all these people knew each other. And, okay. And so you've got, I mean, if you really go back and you look at that time period for rap and hip-hop, there were people running around that are big today that in 1999 you had no idea who they were. But you know them now. So, so we have that in others. I, I think that this is a dynamic which springs up all the time. Okay. Maybe not with literary fiction writers as we get here, but I think that I call it the passion principle. Where there is nothing, exposure to passion builds interest. Where there are people who are interested, exposure to passion builds passion. Where there is where there are passionate people, exposure to passion builds greatness. Okay. So imagine um, I'm trying to think were, have you always been a reader? Yeah. Okay, um, what, what's one of your interests? What's one of your hobbies? Fantasy football. Sure. You never liked fantasy football. Until? Until you had friends who were passionate about it. Yep. Now you're interested in fantasy football. You, you were always a reader, right? Okay. 
Do you remember your first great English teacher? Or, or arts teacher like that, Yeah, right? I'd say so. You remember that person. That person was passionate. Okay. Where you had passion, where you had interest, they exposure had passion. to passion made you passionate. You were now doing a show online about this, right? Where you, where you have passion, Hemingway was passionate about writing. Exposure to F. Scott Fitzgerald, passionate about writing. Exposure to Gertrude Stein, passionate about writing. Exposure to uh, Ezra Pound, passionate about writing. That all claps together and greatness springs from it. Okay. I like to hope at some point, because I, they're in their 20s throughout this novel here. We're a little dated. We're in our late 20s, 30s. I like to hope 30 years from now, when I'm dead and gone, you're going to pin the great uh, Adrian Fort novel of St. Joseph, so I can be a footnote in it. Well, I remember there was that one time that you came to me wondering how small your penis really was, and I, I had to say, look, it's small, but yeah, it's okay, though. <laughs> it's okay. No, again, don't be worried about the penis. It's the testicles that there's something weird with. I don't know what's... We talked about it last week. That scene is so goddamn gorgeous where they go to the Louvre to look at statues to assure Fitzgerald they're like, well, your penis is normal, okay? It's fine. You're fine, Scott. You're just worried over nothing again. You cannot write something that funny. That is gold. Yeah. And from whence that well springs, right? <laughs> Why tell that story? Why tell that story? And that's the thing. I, I imagine that's such an insignificant moment because I'm sure at this period of time, there were some wild times. There are some times in here that we have never heard of that we will never hear of. But for some reason, Hemingway's like, you know what? I'm going to write about that time Scott showed me his dick. Yeah. That's what I'm going to write about today. Well, because what does it do? It shows Hemingway is more sexually experienced than Fitzgerald. It shows everyone that's that Fitzgerald was worried he had a little willy. <laughs> and it shows everyone the terrible person that Zelda was. True. So it just accomplishes all of these propagandistic things for him himself. That yeah. You just imagine Hemingway sitting in his typewriter, a little lit cigar on the ash <laughs> Just oh, I, going I to got town. him this time. I going to town. Time. Uh there are some good things that come from this here. So uh, part of this, uh, we talked about passion. And we are passionate about reading. We're passionate about writing. Uh, everyone has this great idea that to be a writer, you're going to be this lofty artist. You're going to be the one wandering Paris, writing in the cafes. That's the idea of the writer. And we get that here. But Hemingway will be the first one to argue, it's not that glamorous. It kind of sucks. And we get to see that great. We get to see Ernest Hemingway trying to keep the heat on trying to sell stories and sacrificing and faltering and just trying to make ends meet to get to this point where everyone thinks it's going to be perfect. And when he finally gets there, it's not what he wanted. Right. He wants that longing, that uh, idea of the lofty artist still. Well, it's about the hunger, right? He oftentimes talks about um, boxing too. How often does the champion become the champion, get rich, and then fall off? Okay, fair. So it's that hunger that keeps you going. It's the hunger that keeps you going towards your passion. It's not just for boxing, not just for sport, but in general. And there is even a good point here where he's talking about literal hunger and how it was necessary. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to take that from a literary standpoint, maybe you got gold. Yeah. Uh, one thing we do have to consider here, just trying, I was trying to poke holes in this. I'm like, what can we talk about? You know, they, well, it didn't quite make ends meet. This is a historical text. This was written from the standpoint of the 1920s. Uh, so we do get some uh, off-color words from Hemingway, Gertrude Stein's opinions about things that may not be favorable by today's audience. So I, I think going into this, you have to read this from a historical lens. You can't read this as, you know, your buddies last week. You have to accept, you know, this was a very different time. And, you know, there were some, a, some things going on here that, you know, we weren't 100% savvy with today. Or you just have to accept the fact that people are flawed. Right? People are flawed. And that's a big part of this novel, is people are flawed. Uh, everyone has their he problems. Literally tries, he literally thinks he's going to have to coax a man down from a roof with opium. Right? People are flawed. People are flawed. T.S. Eliot, one of the greatest poets of all time, they set a fund to get him out of the bank because he was still working at the bank to make ends meet before The Wasteland came out. Which he liked doing, by the way. Did he like yeah, the bank he, life? he liked the bank. 
Um, he, he was a weird fella, too. Yeah. Uh, just adopted himself as British. He was from St. Louis. So he madonna What? He madonna Madonna did that? Yeah. Anyway, I... I okay, he madonna He madonna um, But he... He madonna <laughs> You got a Himadana. Himadana. I went to the doctor, had my Himadana taken out. No, it was absolutely a thing. I, and, like, I think it came by, there's always that running joke, you know, especially in the music industry. You know, England's big in music, especially that genre of music. So, you know, people go envelop themselves in that, and they come back with an English accent. I'm like, when the fuck did you become English? <laughs> Stop. Uh, anyway. Well, yeah, T.S. Eliot developed his English accent to go there. Yeah? Yeah. So it's it, weird. It, yeah, yeah. He was a he, strange guy. Strange guy. Well, this whole book is filled of strange characters. Well, and it's 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 also filled with the specter of a strange character. Did you catch it? The specter of a strange character. Who's the specter of a strange character? James Joyce. Okay. Yeah. We don't have a scene with James Joyce, do we? But we talk about James Joyce a lot. Oh, like, we're gonna oh, meet we, James Joyce. James Joyce was there with his family. Yeah. He was I looking at the dinner menu like this. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him, but I didn't approach him. But you know, no, we'll talk to him. Let's we'll talk so, to James. I, I, I've got to bring this up now. This is a movie that we both love. Uh, and I, I think you may have been the one who said you need to watch this. And I first watched it and I love it. It's Midnight in Paris with uh, Owen Wilson. Yeah. If you like this book, please watch that movie right now because that's oh, yeah. what it is. The yeah. man goes back in time and envelops himself into this scene. And at one point, he even does that. Do you remember that scene? Does what? He's meeting uh, his fiance's friend for the first time. He's like, oh, yeah, this is the uh, the place uh, my professor told me he saw James Joyce here. He was having dinner with his family, and he ordered uh, frankfurters and sauerkraut. Everybody's waiting, and they're like, "Is that? Oh, is, uh, that's the story? That's it? He's like, well, it wasn't so much of a story. It's just a oh, moment. Oh, I don't remember that at That all. is 100% in the movie. And, like, as soon as you mention that, I'm like, oh, my God. Huh. That is, that's the closest you're going to get to a film adaptation of A Movable Feast. Yeah. Until we crowdfund a film adaptation of A Movable <laughs> Feast, because that has to be filmed. And you're going to have to shave for it. I don't care. That would be an opportunity. <laughs> Either that or I can be the guy being coaxed off the roof. I'm fine with that. <laughs> anyway, back to this. I think it's an amazing text. And uh, again, it, it's hard to say, you know, what we're going to talk about today. Because it is different. I think that it is definitely a text with amazing parts. Okay. I would not call it an amazing text. I am so in love with this. And we're going to get to that rating here eventually. And I know I, I went way higher than you did. Oh, I'm sure you did. I know I did. I'm sure you did. I, I read this for the first time this year. And I, I read this in one sitting. You didn't read it for the first time this year. Was it last year? No, it was two years ago, Dalton. Two years ago? You were gone for a year and a half. Don't That's you remember fair. that? I know. I don't understand timelines. But when I first read this, I sat down. I read it in a sitting. Uh, just a full day, just getting up with breaks. And then I'm like, I have to get Adrian to read this. And it took a while, but you finally did. So I'm yeah. glad you did. feel better about my life now. Good. You feel Good. more complete. I do. I feel more rounded. Yeah. 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 I'm Okay. Anything else you want to talk about with this here? No, I don't think so. Good answer, think so. good answer. Uh, so again, I, I I, don't know what else to say about it. Uh, it's wonderful. I think if you... There, inter- there is the question, and I'm going to bring this up as a selfish thing, because I'm a selfish person, and we're at that point in the review where we don't necessarily have anything left to talk about. The question of Hemingway's religion. Okay. Hemingway is a person who has contradictory quotes on religion, who has stories that are semi-contradictory on religion. And in this, he makes great, great, um, he talks a lot about, it would have been the Christian thing to do, right? You, that phrase I think came up three times in this book. The, it was the Christian way. I, I, I was more of a Christian than he, or he was more of a Christian than I was. Okay. You know? Um, so it is, it is interesting to me, and maybe I'm just wrong on Hemingway and religion, but um, it is interesting to me to see someone who almost undoubtedly had a lifelong struggle with the question. Okay. A different time as well. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Not as easily approachable. Not as easily approachable. Society was more inundated in religion back then, and we did not have all of the scientific facts that we do today. So for me, one of the great things that tore me away from religion was having to give in to the fact that, you know what, yeah, we evolved, 
from lower primates. There was no great creation, right? Okay. Um, so that, that, that was one of the things for me. But back then, those ideas, I mean, Darwin, 1880s, I believe? Ish. Um, so if this is about 1920... Um, it's well known. Well, it's well known. You're 40 years after the fact, but it's still sort of cutting-edge science that there would have been outs for, right? Okay. Um, so it is interesting to see what is probably a man who struggled with religion his entire life reflecting onto a time where he did not struggle with religion as much, it seems, and how that, how that sort of correlates through translation. I think what, again, I've mentioned this, what really sold me on this is like, I identify with this book so much. This is my group of friends. This is that lovely degenerate time where you're just stumbling around trying to find your place. Uh, I could wholeheartedly see myself in that situation trying to coax somebody I don't know off the roof with a bottle of heroin. A, a bottle of opium, not yeah. heroin. Different times, excuse <laughs> me. Um, it, it's wonderful, and it's so identifiable, and it's such an interesting thing that we have this in text form, because I think we get this in video now, because you don't write about all those great times. You pull out the phone and hit that Snapchat button, and we have that glimpse into that world, uh, which eventually we're all going to regret. Well, and it's less permanent. It is. Right? It is. The minute you shut down your Snapchat, that party in 2015 never happened. It's gone. Right? So, Adrian... What would you rate a movable feast by Ernest Hemingway? I would give this 85 penis measuring scenes out of 100. 85? Well, you know you're average. No. Nope. You're right in there. It's, it's average. It's, 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 it's 90, serviceable. It is 94 models. That is fine. Fine book. All of the shit that happened in this book, you pulled out as your measuring stick a bottle of wine? Yes, I did. I did. Airplane shot. It's fine. Talk, it's about, fine. talk about, you know, effort. What would you recommend if you like a movable feast? On the Road? No. No! By Jack Kerouac? No! That is the text that, like, when people want this, they go to On the Road and they're like, oh, it's so great. Like, no, it's not. You fucking read a movable see, feast. See, well, see, that's the thing, though, is that it, where else are you going to get that? It's, 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 it's the writer on his group of writer friends. And if you want a glimpse into a world, which is not your own, more modern take... Where you're getting uh, the grime, the grunge, a degenerate group of people working together. Kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bernain. It was absolutely a huge text that revolutionized the, uh, the cooking industry. It was our first glimpse into that world we've never seen. And it just shot Anthony Bourdain as a star. And like he was the guy who wrote about the things we didn't talk about. It's very, very familiar to this text. Similar or familiar? A little bit of both. You get little hints of a movable feast throughout there. It feels the same. Uh, and you're getting that same style where we're just talking about at that time this happened uh, with this famous person who wasn't famous then, but they are now. Kitchen Confidential is wonderful. Anthony Bourdain is a great writer. All right. Anyway, you want to finish this out here? Uh, so that is what we've got for our four-part series and finally our review on A Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway. If you hit the like button, it really helps us out here on the channel. If you are not subscribed, consider doing so. Maybe hit the bell notification if you want to get a ding every day as we upload through the year. And um, if you would like to help us make more content here on the channel, there is a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below.